Hello, everyone. Welcome to day one of the 2021 Summer Series. Our first session is Gearbox Plate Designs with Code Orange. And our next session is Electronics for FRC with the Robot Dolphins. And we'll begin at 5.50. So without further ado, take it away, Code Orange. We'll begin. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Gearbox Plate Design. Um, I'm Alan. A little background about me, I'm the Code Orange CAD lead this year, um, and I've just designed a couple uh, couple mechanisms over the past few years on, on different Code Orange robots. I'm Jonathan. Um, I've been on the CAD team for, I think, three years now, and I'm just here for the demo portion of the workshop. Oh, uh, yeah, so I think we'll get started now. So. Um, yeah, once again, this is Gearbox Plate Design. And um, just a quick note that um, Code Orange, we usually use SOLIDWORKS for CAD, but um, if you guys have different CAD softwares, that's totally fine, because I think these principles, these basic principles on Gearbox Design should carry over between softwares. So um, I guess we'll just start with the basics on just gear, what is a Gearbox. So if you guys read through this um, kind of block of text, Specifically, a gearbox is a contained gear train. So it's a box with gears inside of it that um, alter the torque and speed between the motor and the output shaft. So here's kind of a basic gearbox setup. We start off with the motor and then we go to a pinion, which is kind of a smaller gear that's driven directly by the motor. And then from the pinion, we go to a gear and then after that, we go to a shaft. And from the shaft, we can go to a mechanism. So that can be like an arm for an arm for like a climb or like rollers for an intake. Here's kind of another diagram of a gearbox. So you can see we start off with the motor and then we go into our input stage or uh, where the pinion comes from the motor and then drives a driven gear. So this is stage one. And then um, and then and then we can come to a second stage or even like a third, fourth or fifth stage. And then from that last stage, we go to our output shaft, which drives the mechanism. Um, so here, here's the importance. Here's where the importance of a gearbox plate comes in. A gearbox plate is essentially a guide or instruction manual for your gearbox. So essentially, if you have a well-designed gearbox plate, uh, you have a well-designed gear, gearbox as a whole because the gearbox plate dictates the distances between holes between bearing holes to make sure that your gears within your gearbox are properly spaced apart. So um, this is kind of Code Orange process, Code Orange's process, process of coming up with a good layout sketch or a, gear, a good gearbox plate. So we start off with goals and constraints. So these could be like torque goals. I need to reach a certain torque at this output shaft, at the output shaft, or I need to reach a certain speed at the output shaft and also like side constraints. Then from that, we go to a layout sketch. So this is just a basic sketch, uh, not that basic, a pretty uh, a pretty messy sketch where I essentially sketch out and draw out where my bearings hold, where my bearing holes are gonna be, where my motor is gonna be, and where, like where my mounting holes are gonna be. And then from that, we turn it 3D. So the boss extrusion is when we take our layout, ske layout sketch and turn it into a real plate. And then from that, we just go straight to assembly assemble our gearbox, and then after the last step is pocketing. So just a big emphasis that always pocket later because a ton of times what I've done is I pocketed first because I get really enthusiastic around pocketing. But if I need to go back and change dimensions of my gearbox, it always gets messed up because pocketing messes up because I always just mess up my pocketing and I have to redo it. And uh, just like an asterisk down here, every team probably has their own method or uh, have their own method of design cure boxes. But uh, this is just our way of doing it. If um, if your team has a better method, that's cool as well. So just, yeah, quick note. And so we'll start off with, um, I'll go, I'll walk through kind of this process. So we start off with our goals and constraints. So as for goals, these could be speed and torque requirements. So for example, an intake roller needs to be very fast, right? So we want to gear it for speed. So our gearbox would be geared for speed. And then a winch needs to pull the robot up. So we want to gear our, we want to place more emphasis on torque when we're making our gearbox. And um, a few constraints could be like size constraints, strength constraints, or weight constraints. So like if our gearbox is in a very like tight spot, located in a very tight spot, we might need to like change the shape or size of our plate, or we might have to have like a flipped gearbox just to keep the size down. 
And then there's also like strength constraints. So um, for example, if we, there's like a lot of torque that's being acted on your, that's acting on your plate. So like you're dealing with very high torque, you might need a thicker plate. Or like if your gearbox is out outside exposed on your, on your robot and like it might be hit by like the wall or something, then uh, you might want thicker plates. And then there's also weight, weight constraints. So like if you're very close, we've been here a lot of times where we're like a quarter pound away from the max weight limit. Um, you might have to like, you might have to do some more pocketing or gearbox or like make use the thinner plates. So yeah, those are just a couple goals and constraints to keep in mind when we're designing our gearbox plates. And then the next step would be a layout sketch. So um, here's just a quick diagram. Uh, we don't really have to pay attention to the rest of this stuff except for pitch circle and pitch diameter circle, pitch, pitch circle diameter. So um, what's really important when we're designing, when we're spacing gears apart within a gearbox is the pitch diameter. So essentially a basic rule with gearboxes is if we, if we dimension, if we dimension two pitch diameters and make them tangent to each other in the middle. So they're, uh, let me turn on my, if we dimension two, uh, two pitch diameters and make them tangent. So right here, they're tangent only connected by one point, then the gears will mesh correctly. And uh, here's just another example. So um, right now I'm gonna be using a 48 tooth 20 DP gear and an 80 tooth 20 DP gear. So these are just two kinds of gears that we can get from VEX. And you can see these two sketch circles are pitch diameters. So this pitch diameter is 2.4 inches in diameter. This pitch diameter is four inches. So by making them tangent, and um, spacing the bearings around this tangent dement, this tangent relation. This allows me to properly space my gears apart. And um, on top of that, a quick side note is that sometimes, uh, depending on like how accurate your machines are, or like your uh, like whatever, if you're using like a router or a water jet to cut your plates, you might need to add a little bit of tolerance because sometimes machines they can be either they can oversize the dimensions or they can undersize the dimensions. So we want to be really accurate with the spacing between gears. So you might have to add like a couple, uh, like a, a couple, a tiny, tiny dimension to space them properly. Uh, so here's just kind of um, kind of an outline of the gearbox layout sketch. So we first want to decide what gears we want to use based off of the ratio we want. So this comes from the goals and constraints that I mentioned earlier. And then on top of that, within our sketch, we, we need to include include tangent pitch diameters, the motor footprint, motor mounts, and bearings. And um, so this, uh, a big emphasis on the motor footprint, because sometimes if the gears are too small, the motor, like the outer diameter of the motor, will interfere with some of the bearings within our driven gears. So um, this could be a problem because then we can't fit a bearing anymore. So uh, if we draw out the motor footprint, we can easily see if there are any problems with like the motor interfering with the bearing. So um, here's kind of an example of a pretty simple gearbox layout sketch. So um, it's just, I'm just gonna go over all, point out all the big parts of it. So um, I'm gonna start with the motor shaft hole. So, um, so a lot of motors that we have have these like hubs on the motor. So this is just a hole to fit the hub of the motor. So the motor can, so the motor can be attached to our, to our plate. And the next is the motor footprint. So this can just be a construction line that just shows the outer diameter of the motor. And then we have our motor mount holes. So these are just like two holes, two or four holes, whatever, just to uh, mount the motors. So this looks to be a, a Neo motor. So we're gonna be using uh, the two mounting holes that are on a Neo. And then next we have a bearing hole. So this is, a, this is just a hole a cut out so we can put a bearing to support the shaft. And then right here, you can see we have gear pitch diameters. So the first diameter is this big circle. And then the second diameter is a smaller circle. And um, a big thing is keeping it, keeping our layout sketches organized. So um, a good layout sketch involves tons of overlapping lines, which is great, but it also come, becomes a problem because you don't really know what's going on after a while. So yeah, if I go back to this slide, this is a pretty simple looking gearbox. It's only a one stage. So I only have one pinion and then one driven gear. But um, if we're doing like two or even maybe three stage, uh, if we're doing layout sketches for two or even three stage gearboxes, then we become a problem because there's just so many construction lines and like defined lines. So um, here are just a couple rules that uh, we like to use. 
when we're making these these layout sketches to make sure that there's like standards and like continuity between each layout sketch. So um, use construction lines to exclusively for pitch diameters and motor footprint circles. And then use normal lines or um, in SOLIDWORKS, uh, just like the, the defined, the thick defined lines, use these lines exclusively for motor, motor mounting holes, bearing holes, and the outline of your plate. And then another point is sketch labels. So sketch labels are essentially allow you to just label different circles or dimensions within your sketch. And these are super helpful. These are sometimes super helpful, sometimes super helpful when, um, when you're just dealing with a ton of uh, a ton of different gears and different motors. So um, if you want, if you want, you can label pitch diameters with your specifications. So like if I have a two inch pitch diameter, then I'll label that, oh, that's a 42, 20 DP gear. And then on top of that motor footprint circles, you can label them as motor specifications. So I, I can point out, oh, this is a Neo motor, just for future reference if you're looking back at it. So here's kind of an example of a layout sketch. This is a, uh, this looks like a two, this is a two stage layout sketch. And it's, uh, you can see the labels in action kind of. So you can see right here, I have, um, I have an out motor footprint circle and a type over here. It's a Neo, not a Neo 550, but um, here's just a, just a good example, because uh, when it gets complicated, it's really helpful to have labels. So uh, that's kind of um, that's kind of the kind of a basic rundown of how to create a good a good looking gearbox layout sketch and like a gearbox plate. So the next uh, next stage of this is going to be a demo run by Jonathan. So he's going to design a single stage seven seven a single stage gearbox with a seven seven five Pro with a seven to one reduction. So uh, yeah, Jonathan, take it away. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me pull up SolidWorks really quick. Oh, and um, just um, just letting you guys know, um, we will be answering questions after uh, Jonathan's demo. So um, just like throw them in the chat or something, and then we'll answer them right after. Yeah, okay. So Alan did a great presentation. Um, we're just going to do a demo because it's a lot of information to take in. And usually I find it easier to learn by doing rather than just like watching a lecture. So we're just going to open SOLIDWORKS. Remember this is in SOLIDWORKS and not another program. If you use another program, like Alan said, the idea is translate. So walking down the list of things to include in the layout sketch, I'm just going to start with the gears because that's pretty much the main part of the gearbox. And we will be using um, circles to represent the gears. And I already have the dimensions pulled up on another tab. And this is this will be the pinion, okay? And the pinion should be a construction line. And then I'll put a gear directly horizontal to the pinion. And these are both construction geometry because they're for reference. And the gear is two point inches in diameter. And this will be a seven to one gearbox. And it will be driven by a 775 Pro. So the what I'm going to do first is actually the motor footprint. And the motor is actually 1.744 inches in diameter. And since this is also for reference, it's not a hole, I will be making a construction line. And then, like Alan said, there's a motor hub on every motor. And you need a hole for the shaft, obviously. And this is actually a hole in the plate. So it will stay a defined line. It's 0.689. And then I will just put in the mounting holes for the motor because we don't want to get the mounting or we don't want gears to be in the way of the mounting holes. You guys can see that this big gear 
is actually kind of taking up some of the motor footprint. So we'll probably want to put the mountain holes vertically right here. I'm just going to use a midpoint line. And the bolt circle of a 775 Pro is 1.142. One point one four two. Okay. And this is obviously for construction. And I'll just put holes on either side and make them equal by pressing and then shift and then click and making them equal. Oops. Did I do that? Yeah, okay. And these are for M4 screws, and the clearance of M4 is 4.5 millimeters. All right, so our layout sketch is pretty much coming together, but there's one more thing missing. We've been through the pinion, we've done the gear, we've done the motor, pretty much everything concerning the motor. And then now we need the bearing hole for the big gear. And thunder hexes, hexes, those kind of bearings, those are all pretty much 1.125 in diameter. And then since I guess we're pretty much done, uh, we can just extrude this. Actually, not yet. You need to put a rectangle around it first. This is the simplest way to just turn your layout sketch into a plate. Obviously, if you're working with tighter, uh, tighter dimensions, then you could extrude it differently. But this is how I would do it. I'm just going to dimension it uh, 0.3 away from each gear. So up and down on the big gear, and then side to side on this big gear and this smaller, uh, actually, and the motor. So how you do this is you hold shift, click on the line, and click on the circle. That's how you dimension it. Now just go through these really quick. One more. Oh, so here's our plate. Pretty sure everything's on it. And I will be extruding it to a quarter of an inch. I do that because when you put in a bearing in a eighth inch plate, it actually sticks out on the other side. That can become a problem when like the shaft can fall out. So a quarter inch is usually nicest. And I don't think you guys want to watch me assembling the whole gearbox on stream. So I prepared uh, the complete assembled version. So the motor goes here, right? The pinions go here and the, the bearings are all on both sides. It, and you can reuse the same plate. So in this case, I use the same plate, but I also put on put standoff holes on all four corners. This is pretty much it. I also pocketed it. And if you guys want to see the the design I'll, or see what I did for the sketch, sorry, that's not it. If you guys want to see the sketch, here it is. So when I pocket, usually I try to divide it in like four, four areas pretty much. And this time it was like an X shape right here, these two construction lines, or it's pretty much like a, a, a center rectangle. And then it'll automatically make these kind of triangular shapes around the bearing. And of course, when you do this, you make the you make a circle around the bearing hole because you don't want to make the bearing hole bigger. And then you're just basically removing material because it's too heavy. And that's pretty much it. I put some like rectangles up on the top and the bottom of the motor. It wasn't necessary, but here's how it turned out. Do you have any questions, Alan? <laughs> Yeah, um, nice demos, uh, nice demo. So um, I guess now 
We open up to questions. Okay, um, I'm just gonna be reading through the uh, chat on the live stream and um, just reading out questions. So, um, how do you pocket effectively when manufacturing? Uh, not really sure. So at least what we do when we manufacture our plates is um, we just do it on either like a CNC router or the or we have, we're lucky enough to have a water jet. So um, that's kind of how we do it. We just, um, someone just takes our CAD or uh, Jonathan maybe takes our CAD and then uh, he cams it. So he turns um, he turns the our like plate into a set of G code, send it over to CNC router or um, or the water jet, and then just gets cut for us. Um, if we were doing it uh, just like kind of manually, I'm kind of I'm not really sure how we would pocket manually. Um, but yeah, hope that kind of answers your question. And pocketing is just removing material. So if you find like parts where you could just like drill big holes into, I guess that would work too. Yeah. Um, how do you determine the spacing between the plates? Uh, Jonathan, I think you can answer this question. Yeah, so you usually wanna keep the, the plates as close together as possible because when you have a, a gear on a shaft, pretty much, uh, let me show you guys. When you have a gear on a shaft, there's, there's like a, a force being applied on it, pretty much. And the closer, or actually I'll say, if it's far away from the plate or far away from a support, kind of, if I put a gear all the way out here, then it would be able to kind of flex a little bit. So we want to put our plates as close together as possible. Obviously, this assembly is pretty bad because I didn't put spacers in between the bearings and the gears. Usually, you would put in like a, a tiny little spacer in there to reduce friction. But you want it as close as possible. I muted. Um, do you typically? use the same plate for both sides of a gearbox or not often um so at least sometimes we use the same plate sometimes not um at least i'll say most of the time we have our like gearboxes they're usually bolted directly to like a mechanism that has um they're usually bolted directly to like a mechanism that has like an arm or something that has like the output shaft kind of built into the mechanism so we usually only need us like one plate, usually only one plate. So like if we're like making a gearbox for like to spin like a hopper, then um, usually like we have our plate for the back of the gearbox that attaches the motor to the gearbox, but usually like the front is the hopper side plate or something like that. But um, it's really just up to whatever scenario it is, whatever scenario, scenario it, uh, it applies to. Yeah, I can say like if you're designing a three-stage gearbox, you probably want to remove the motor mount on the third plate, right? But in this case, it was simplest just to copy the plate over. Of course, there's going to be scenarios where you want to make changes. But basically, the, the idea I want you guys to get is that you, if you have a layout sketch, then you can apply it to every stage, but just take out certain parts of it. If that makes sense. Um, okay, so the next question is, how thin of webbing do you typically leave on each pocket segment slash between them? Wait, can you repeat that? Hi, Mike. Uh, here, Jonathan, do you wanna read the questions? Oh, wait, I don't have the link open. Oh, sorry. I'll try to fix my mic while, um, while Jonathan. No, you're, no, I think your mic is open. Oh, it works? Yeah, 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 I can hear you. Oh, okay. 
Um, okay, so um, how thin of webbing do you typically leave on each pocket slat segment or between them? So like over here pretty much? Um, I was just thinking like the like the supports. Oh, right here. Yeah, like that, yeah. Okay, so this is like quarter inch plate. So I left a quarter inch right here. I'm not like really sure about the rules about the webbing, but since it's a pretty thick plate, I would feel safe with a quarter inch. But make sure if you're dealing with high loads and stuff, to it doesn't hurt to put maybe a little extra unless the robot's overweight. <laughs> and for eighth plate, maybe I would put like 0.3 or 0.4. That might be a mentor question, depending on like your team. Yeah, it's really, uh, once again, this one's also really conditional based off of how much load you're gonna, you're thinking is gonna, your, how much load you think your plate's gonna experience. So um, yeah, for like a gearbox like this, might be super high load, so like a quarter might work. Um, but um, like for like something like a belly pan, which is like, um, you know, it's like uh, kind of protected by your drive by your drive rails. Um, what I like to do is I like to put around an eighth and like really really thin pocketing because um, it really saves a lot of weight. But um, yeah, it's just really conditional. Um, how much room do you count for between the gear and the plates? Um. So at least for some gearboxes, oh, Jonathan, could you rotate your view to like a side view kind of, of like the, of the gear and the, and the bearings, or if you can do a, if you can do a cross section, that'd be oh, great. Okay. This way? Yeah. So okay. if we look at well, that kind of, this kind of uh, look right here, um, at least in this scenario, we can actually just have no room between the plates and the gear because uh, at least th this is a VEX gear that we're using. The VEX gear has a built-in hub. So what that hub allows us to do is it allows us to put it right against the bearing because it is, it's properly distanced away from the bearing so that the gear won't be rubbing against the bit bearing to introduce extra friction. And, um, and yeah, it, it just distances the face of the gear away from like the, the rest of the bearing. So um, we can pretty much just put the gear right against the bearing without experiencing it. I just want to know that kind of like hub on the gear is down here, at the bottom right, it's 0 0.06 around there, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Oh, um, I was gonna read. Um, okay. So, Jonathan, can you reopen the sketch? Yeah. I think someone wants to see just um, the dimensions that we have. Sure. You guys can screenshot that. And if you want the pocketing one also, I can open it. I think my SOLIDWORKS cuts off the numbers kind of, or rounds up. So it might not be most accurate from this point of view. Okay, um, I, th I think we'll move to the next question. Um, how do we choose gear ratios and what is opinion for? Um, so at least for, choosing gear ratios it's uh this one's also very dependent on what kind of mechanism the gearbox is for so um i'll just do an example for a drive base at least so um on our on just like a standard west coast drive base of uh, what we usually do we've done a couple years uh a couple years in like 2018 i think we have like the vex pro uh the vex pro shifting gearbox so that gave us like two gear ratios that can shift between. And um, one of them was high torque and one of them was geared for more speed. 
So um, I think this is a good example of how we choose gear ratios because it's um, because it kind of gives us two states. So whenever we want to push a robot around, this is in 2018, whenever we want to like fight against defense or push a robot around, we would shift to the higher torque gear reduction. So this would be a like a, I don't know what the exact number was, but it would be like, it would be like a, a uh, one to five. So from our driven, our driving gear to our driven gear, it would be a one to five reduction. That's just an example. I don't think it was that, but um, so that's like high torque. If you want to push something around, if we want, if we want to push something around, and then if we wanted to go fast, if we want to go, go fast and like do a lot of cycles really quickly, we would shift to the higher speed, quote unquote. So um, it wouldn't exactly be like a, it wouldn't exactly be like a five. So I'm talking driving gear, like a five to one, that would be way too fast, but it would be like a little bit, it would be like a little bit lower torque. So it would be like a, maybe like a one to like one to two. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact gear ratios were, but like, it would kind of be like that. So um, it's just it's dependent course. on if you want high torque or high speed. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So like, to calculate that, I guess you, if you want like speed, you get your, your end, like what you want. And then actually wait, the motor speed and then times a whatever X ratio equals what you want. And then for torque, that would be the same thing you want, or we use a JVN calculator also for torque. And yeah, that's like for really the climbers and stuff and elevators. Um, and I think you can find the JVN calculator on Chief Delphi or uh, because I think that's where uh, there's like a post there. So yeah, JVN calculator, calculator is really helpful. Um, if you were making something crazy, like a six stage gearbox, would you need plate sandwiching each stage? Um, not necessarily. So, um, pretty much the main idea behind having two plates for a gearbox is we're supporting the shaft at two points. So at all times within a gearbox, we want to support the shaft with at two points, because if you only support at one, it's going to start like doing some, like, it's going to start trying to push the shaft up or push the shaft down and it's going to dislodge the bearing. So we always want two points of connection. So this can either be, can you go back to your uh, to your old assembly, like the top level? Thank you. Um, so it can be kind of like this, where the gear is sandwiched between two bearings, or it could be what we call like a cantilever. So we can have two bearings on one side and then the gear. Um, let me see, if, I don't really have an example in my room, but like two bearings on one side and then the gear on the other. That also works, but we generally always want two bearings. So um, to answer your question, if you were making something crazy like a six-stage gearbox, you could get away, I'd say, with having only two plates and then just having like a ton of bearings just like in a line going down or something. Um, but sometimes you might want some like support in between or like add like an encoder stage, then you'd have to add a plate. But um, you can get away with doing two plate with doing only two plates. Yeah, maybe something like this. Yeah. Right. So yeah, or so that would be like a cantilever. So um, it's kind of like levered over. Uh, I don't know why it's called a cantilever, but just how, kind of how it tur turns out. Um, next question. Um, how do you typically decide on which direction the, the bearing flanges go? Oh, okay. I think I can take this one. Um, uh, flanges basically stop the bearing from falling out in a certain direction. So you can see right now it's disconnected. And once it hits this flange right here, it'll stop. But it, you can pull it out this way pretty much. And usually a shaft has a snap ring groove over here. So a snap ring pretty much holds the end of the shaft. And when the shaft slides through, it'll hit the bearing. And since the bearing flange is stopped by the plate, then this whole shaft cannot move in this direction. And then if I put the bearing over here, the flange on the opposite side, and I put another snap ring groove here, 
then uh, it will be stopped on the other side. But usually, we, I think it's kind of scary to put snap ring grooves in the middle of a shaft. So usually, I, I find another way to retain the shaft. But pretty much, bearings are meant for, or where the flange is, is based off of where you want to put snap ring grooves and where they don't get in the way. Um, and just to add to that, so if you want to like really kind of, so sometimes you have like a weird messed up gearbox where you can't necessarily fit like the two flanges on the outsides of the plates. When that happens, uh, to determine like where to put your snap rings or like which direction to face your flanges, something that I like to do is I like to just take like a snip, use uh, the snipping tool, and then just take like a kind of screenshot of the gearbox. And then from that, I'll just draw. So I just draw kind of, where I just kind of think about it, think about, oh, if I pull on if I pull on this side, will the shaft fall out? Or if I pull on this side, will the shaft fall out? So I just kind of draw like little arrows. And then it just gives me a visual aid to kind of think about uh, just like where the shaft can fall out, where the bearings can fall out. And then based off that, you can kind of kind of helps you determine where to put snap rings, where to put bearings. And uh, also on top of that, uh, we like to use I we like to use snap rings, at least for code orange. I know a lot of teams sometimes use like shaft collars or like bolts with a washer at the end of shafts. Those work too, uh, but uh, we just use snap rings because they're nice and convenient. Um, would you recommend the plates being square or could you use irregular shapes like a trapezoid or does it just depend on what you need it for? Um, yes, so uh, most of the time it depends what you need it for. So uh, like when Jonathan was catting this gearbox, he didn't really need to fit it around like some other some other geometry within the robot. So he just, you can just do a square, which is pretty straightforward. But um, I will say though, I will say um, having cool shapes like trapezoids or like a triangle or something makes the gearbox look way cooler. So um, yeah, if you want like the cool factor, the popping looks way cooler when you just do like a kind of irregular shape. But um. Uh, but I'd stress, I would stress um, like quality and like capability over the coolness. But um, if you just have extra time or something, weird shapes look cooler. <laughs> <laughs> also, if like there's a mechanism here that was that was going to collide with the gearbox, you could totally cut this part off right here. And you can do like circles around each like gear and motor, and then do like a quarter inch around or distance, sorry. Just depends like where, what's most convenient. All right, so um, any more questions? Just so uh, if you have any more, just, let, just type them in the chat. How do we buy belts or chain? So um, where we usually buy them, at least for Code Orange, we buy them from Vex or uh, actually West Coast Products. Uh, West Coast Products is very similar to sell a lot of the same things as Vex. It's just like the shipping's, the shipping's cheaper. So um, if you're on the West Coast, the West Coast Products, if not Vex or whatever close retailer sells the Vex stuff. Um, but on top of that, for chain at least, um, if you want to do like different sizes of chain, I know Vex only sells 25 or 35 chain. Um, McMaster is really helpful as well. Uh, they have like, I think 35 to H chain, like heavy chain. They have some really cool chain sizes. So um, that works as well. And then um, where we also get belts, where we also get belts is from a website called SDP slash IO. Um, stock drive parts or something. I don't know what it's called. SDP slash IO. And um, uh, they uh, sell some really interesting. I. Oh, what? Oh, it's such I. I oh, whoops. <laughs> uh, they sell some uh, really interesting like belts, pulley sizes. So like Vex only sells like a couple. This website sells pretty much everything from like from like twenty tooth belt all the way to like a two hundred and then plus sizes like seven hundred twenty teeth, a thousand teeth. Really interesting. And they also sell thin belts, which are like six millimeter. And so I'm talking about these are GT2 three millimeter belts. So they usually come nine millimeters thick. They also sell thin six millimeter belts. 
So um, yeah, and like cool pullers and stuff. That's a cool site that we also use sometimes. Yeah, and I think WCP has a really good belt calculator for like measuring the distance you need or how big of a belt you need for a certain distance. So when you're designing, make sure you consult the calculator and make sure it fits those dimensions. Um, hey everyone, we are back with electronics for FRC with team 5199. Caden, take it away. Hi everyone. So today I'm gonna be going over just the basics of electricity along with all the components that you might see in a typical FRC robot. So starting off, probably the most basic thing in electronics, wires. Wires are strands of metal that carry the flow of, electro of electrons, meaning conduct electricity. Um, we have two main types that we'll see, solid wires visible in the top right. These you might only see if you do like electronics tinkering. Otherwise on FRC robots, you'll always see stranded wires. These are thin filaments of copper all wrapped together. Um, if you take multiple wires or sometimes just one and cover it in a shield of insulation, that's a cable. In the bottom right is a common cable, ethernet. This is what you might see on the radio. So the basics of electricity. Voltage is measured in volts with a V. It's described as the electric potential difference or the electric pressure that pushes electrons through the circuit. More formally, it's called an electromotive force, a force that pushes electrons through the circuit. And it is basically like pressure in a pneumatic system. Resistance is measured in ohms, which has a Greek omega. It's described as the opposition to the flow of electric current. And it's largely based on like the surface area, uh, volume, cross section of the wire and the material. Um, it's kind of like friction in a mechanical system. Current is amperes or amps with an A, and it's the number of charges, meaning electrons, that pass through a certain part of the wire in a given second. So basically the rate of flow over time. Power is measured in watts, and this is the rate of electrical energy over time. Uh, this can apply in a number of different ways, like the amount of power dissipated as heat through a circuit or the power dissipated by a light bulb, anything like that. And then Ohm's law. So this is one of the most basic electrical engineering laws, but you'll see it come up over and over again if you keep looking at electronics. Voltage equals current times resistance. Uh, this is written V equals IR with I for current. And now on to some FRC components. So starting off, from our battery, we split the positive wire connection between the battery and the power distribution panel um, with our 120 amp breaker. So this component, it acts as an on off switch for the robot and it ensures that we, like a battery failure, won't critically overload the robot and start a fire. Um, so on off switch, but if a current greater than 120 amps goes through it, it'll automatically turn itself off. Then our power distribution panel. Just a sec. Okay. Our power distribution panel takes power from the battery and distribute it, distributes it out to all the robot's components. It also acts as the terminating point for the CAN bus the main signaling system used on our robot. So it has lots of ports on the side to power things like motor controllers mostly or other components. On each of those ports, it has breakers installed. These basically, when a current uh, greater than the breakers rated amperage flows through it, it'll pop and cut off the connection. Again, this is a safety mechanism. Um, at the bottom, as you can see here, are special power ports for the PCM, VRM, and RoboRio. These are special components I'll touch on later. And in 2022, our next season, 
it'll be replaced by the power distribution hub, a new component. Um, this has some cool new features like reading out your battery voltage directly, WAGO terminals, and a USB-C connection for debugging. So to go over some motor controllers, the Talon SRX motor controller is a brushed motor controller, meaning that it's used for DC motors like the 775 Pro. So this just directly takes in power from the PDP, is controlled by the CAN bus, and it regulates the amount of power flowing to our motor so that we can like finally control the speed. The Spark Max. So this is a motor controller with three wires coming out of it because it's used to control brushless motors like NEOs, um, which are AC power. That's why we have a third wire. And that third wire is white. Um, if you do use just the red and black, though, you can still control a DC motor like a 775 Pro. The Victor SPX motor controller, this is much the same as the Talon SRX, but a little simpler, lacking features like current limiting, but usually uh, functions exactly the same. So our pneumatics control module, PCM, this is also controlled by the CAN bus, and it's the hub for controlling all of our pneumatic components, our solenoids, which are electronically controlled valves, our compressor for actually generating that air pressure, and our pressure switch. Uh, the pressure switch limits our compressor to 120 PSI, as usual, for safety. Um, in 2022, this will be replaced by the Rev Pneumatics Hub. This, again, has features like USB-C for testing, um, better CAN terminals, and analog digital ports for our pressure switch just for more variety. So our voltage regulator module. This is a small rectangle that takes in power from the PDP and puts it out as more finely regulated combinations of current and voltage. Most notably, this is what you will use to power the radio. Um, and now onto the radio. So this is how we wirelessly control the robot. It enables wireless communication from the driver station and the robot reel. It is powered by the PoE injector, which takes Ethernet from the robot reel and power from the VRM. Um, this and by to some extent the VRM will both be replaced by the Rev Radio Power module in 2022. So this takes in a connection directly from the PDP and puts out a like well-controlled PoE connection directly to the radio. So the Robo Rio, this is the robot's brain, as we call it. It's the central processing unit of the robot. It's controlled wirelessly from our driver station through the ethernet from the radio. And this is what starts the CAN bus. It's the origin because it sends out the signals to control all of the other components on the CAN bus. It also has PWM ports for controlling things like servos and digital input output ports for things like limit switches. So the RSL is our robot signal light. It's controlled by a special RSL port on the Robo Rio. It has a very specific way to be connected if you notice, it has three terminals. So you need to take your positive wire that goes to LA. You bridge or jumper that wire to LB. And then your negative wire runs through the middle. So kind of a fork there. It has a couple different uh, light up combinations, which indicate certain things. So first, if the light's off, your robot's off. If the light is on and solid, then you're on. but in software, your robot is disabled. If it's blinking, then you're both on and enabled in software. To go more in depth on the PoE injector, this is power over ethernet, and it's what helps our robo Rio and radio uh, talk to each other. It just carries ethernet and power in one connection, as the name kind of implies. And it's 12 volts at two amps from the VRM. The CAN bus. So 
the controller area network bus. This is just the main control signal that we use on the robot. It's used in automotives a lot, cars, and it starts at the RoboRio, ends at the PDP. It is daisy chained between motor controllers and the PCM, which is basically the connection flows into one motor controller and back out into the next and back out. So just a big kind of loop that touches each component and then dips back out. So the signal of the CAN bus, it actually is sent because it's all one kind of joined wire or really two. Um, the signal reaches every component on the bus, but the signal is sent with a address. So it only targets a single component. So it'll, or the RoboRio will point out a specific motor controller when it sends the instruction. So all the other motor controllers will ignore it. And on the topic of motors, um, these are basically, well, you would know they convert electricity to rotation. We have a bunch of different motors available for FRC. So you have some things to consider when choosing one. You have to look at the torque of the motor, kind of its turning force, its RPM, which is how fast it rotates, and then the weight. Because motors are heavy, they can very quickly have you hit the weight limit if you have too many. Um, brushless motors, these are one of our two main types of motors. As I said earlier, they have AC power, so three wires go to the motor. This would be a neo motor, like in the bottom right. Um, brushed motors, these are kind of your more standard ones. They have just a red and a black wire. These are things like the SIM, which is a bit older, or the 775 Pro, which is still a good lightweight option. Um, brushless motors, to touch on some current models, the Neo and the Falcon 500. The Falcon 500 is a special case because only a red and black wire go to it because it has a motor controller integrated on the back of it. So if you see how it's kind of two cylinders, that back cylinder is its motor controller. So motor controllers, these take power in from the PDP and then the motor controller outputs that as a regulated power to the motor. Um, brushed motor controllers, I touched on them before, the Victor SPX and the Talon SRX. Well, brushless motor, uh, motor controllers are the Spark Max and the Talon, Talon FX. Again, that's our motor controller on the back of the Falcon 500. All right, so that's everything I was hoping to go over today. Do we have any questions? We have a couple questions from the chat. Um, so our first one is, does the amount of voltage affect how fast the current gets to the end of the circuit? So if we go back to, there we go, Ohm's law. This is a kind of proportional constant um, relationship. So if we increase that voltage, then that current has to step up as a result because that resistance is typically gonna be fixed within our circuit. So you can kind of think of it as we have more flow, it pushes the electrons faster through the circuit, so we get more flow. Okay, and then our next question is, is there a trick in order to plug wires into the PDP fast and efficiently without messing up the end of the wire? So, don't, I would say that it's best to really twist it into a very kind of sturdy end cap that won't like come apart easily or fray. And then honestly, having two people there, one to use a screwdriver to lever open the terminal and one to just line it up, making sure there's no loose ends, probably the best method. But if I go to the PDP, now the power distribution hub. These use a new type of terminal, no longer wide molars, which are the lever type. Um, these are called WAGOs. So you basically flip open a latch, just put your wire in and then close it down and it'll actually kind of grab it and hook in. So it's a very secure 
and very easy connection. Okay, thank you. And then our next question is, any tips for keeping the electrical components safe but still easily accessible on the robot? I would say that the best way is to try and prioritize having them in an open area or to have them be detachable from the robot. For example, if you have your electronics kind of down underneath your like your wheelbase, make it so that you can actually like slide out the panel on some kind of tracks or just a couple screws and have the whole panel drop down. So try to just kind of, yeah make it accessible and protect it with paneling because polycar panel is extremely light, still see-through so you can see your issues and very easy to just create a little bent box around it. Perfect. Um, and then our next question is, any tips for robust wiring, soldering versus crimped connectors? It, it really depends. Crimping is probably a better choice most of the time because solder can, yeah, for most FRC applications, I would say crimping is typically better because you can always reinforce a crimp with solder. As an example, if you put a ring terminal onto a wire, you can crimp it. And if you still aren't like certain in the connection, you can then actually fill it in with solder to create a better bond between the wire and the terminal. Okay, um, another question from Teddy. Do any of the components require you to solder the wire to it or would you only solder two wires together? So I don't have a photo here, but the main component that you'll actually be soldering with is most likely the battery. Because even though you can often find pre-built battery wires, this 120 amp breaker here, you kind of always have to cut your positive wire to put this in the middle. Um, because those pre-built kits typically have the red and black wires the same length. So you can't just put it at the end without massively distending your wire. Um, those connections actually are it's unlucky that the main wire that you typically have to solder is one of the hardest to solder because this is a thick size four wire that you have to put uh, ring terminals on. So my advice would to be using a soldering gun, um, just a high powered soldering iron basically uh, with a lot more wattage that just heats up that really thick wire and thick terminal a lot faster because using a normal iron, you will really struggle to get the solder to melt down into the core of that thick wire. And also use flux just for the heat dissipation because otherwise it'll again take 45 plus minutes for a single connection. Okay, perfect. And then for the beginners, could you quickly explain what soldering and crimping and all that actually is? Sure, so soldering this is melting down a very low melting point metal, almost as a type of glue, a conductive glue. So you have a soldering iron in one hand, kind of like a pencil with a really hot tip. And in the other hand, you have a strand of solder coming off a spool. So you take your soldering iron, put it on your wire or your component, and then you feed solder in, um, as it heats up and it'll melt onto the component or the wire and hold it together. And then crimping. So crimping is basically just putting a terminal, which is some kind of like end piece onto your wire. A ring terminal, which I mentioned before, this is a small metal tube that your wire sits in and then a ring that you can put a screw in or that you can mount on some kind of peg. Um, there are some others like spade terminals. These are really secure terminals that bond together with another wire. And probably most common one that you'll see in FRC is Anderson's. Anderson power poles 
are a type of terminal that you have to crimp on. So these are latching, latching terminals because you put on a little metal tube, you crush it around the wire, forming a really strong bond, and then you put it into a housing for insulation so that you don't have that exposed metal. And then your connections can just click together very easily with right polarity every time. Okay, and this kind of relates to the last question, but are there any good practices or tools for crimping? For crimping, I would invest or recommend investing in a dedicated Anderson Power Pool Power Pull Tri Crimp, I believe it's called. This just really helps facilitate crimping all the different sizes because crimping can almost always be done using just a pair of pliers, maybe a screwdriver to kind of, because your end goal is always to just crush the terminal around the wire. But using a dedicated tool can often make it a lot easier and have a lot less risk of your connections coming loose. And one wire coming apart can easily shut down your robot. So it's typically worth the investment. Okay, perfect. And then what would you say the most important part of electronics is? With electronics, it is going back to what I just said, it is very important to have good practice and to just be careful because it's such a interconnected system. Like if you cut off power to one component, it can lead to like shutdown of many other components or just failure of the robot as a whole. So just always checking your connections, making sure your cables are like held down with zip ties or tape or really anything so that they don't get caught on things. Um, making sure that when your team is like changing out a gearbox that the wires aren't affected or pulled out somehow. Just small things like that, just to always be sure. Um, perfect. And our next question is, any, do you have any training advice and tips on cable management? So those are two separate questions. Um, for cable management, for training, here, I'll start with advice. So I would really recommend using zip tie mounts. These are small plastic rectangles with one side that's sticky. And on the other side, it has a crossway of holes. And these just make it very simple to kind of slap one on a tube on your robot and then run a zip tie through. Since it's a strong adhesive, there's not much of a worry because there typically won't be enough force on the wire to pull the mount off. And it saves a lot of trouble of having to like drill through a tube to run a wire through, which causes its own, its own host of issues. Um, also just, this goes back to your electrical board layout in that your cables will be managed kind of in main routes. So going back to my, like my team's robot last year, we had a big pathway of wires up from our turret, from the ball shooter coming down to our power distribution panel. For cable management, we used a track to actually hold all of those wires together and secure them rather than letting them all be kind of loose free floating. So there's a lot of tools at your disposal at your disposal to kind of just keep all your cables moving how you want and expect them to move. Um, and let's see for training. For training, I, I think the best way to learn cable management is really just hands-on, like making a layout and seeing what works and what doesn't is really helpful to learn and grow there. So this would be best on something like a practice bot or an off-season robot if you have the resources. Otherwise, just kind of taking components and laying them out and just trying things, I guess, to figure out 
how you can be efficient with your wiring and also careful with your wiring. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is from Taylor. Do you have a general breakdown of what gauge wire should be used when? Okay. So this is actually something nice about this diagram here in that the top right, you can see the thickness basically tells you what gauge. So most motor controllers are always going to be 12 gauge. Um, this is kind of the standard that you'll be using for the most part anytime you're carrying a sufficient amount of power. For smaller components like the Robo Rio, uh, VRM, PCM, anywhere in the range of like 16 to 18, typically 18 though, um, will work. And this is just because they take less power in. Small things like sensors, the RSL, the radio, these can all get away with very small wires like 26 gauge. Sometimes you change it a little, but 26 is kind of the standard for those smaller, delicate, not very power hungry parts. And then of course the battery, you can again use a range, but don't go higher than gauge six because you'll add a lot of resistance that'll wear out your battery faster. And actually I should have touched on this before. The higher the gauge, the smaller the diameter of the wire and the smaller the cross section of the wire, the more resistance you have as you increase that power. So smaller wires are for like smaller parts, basically. It's pretty simple. And oftentimes you can estimate, but yeah, six for battery, 12 for motors and motor controllers, 18 for other parts, and 26 for like sensors. Perfect, thank you. Our next question is from Sterling. What's your preferred motor controller for both brushless and brushed and why? I would say that for brushed motors, I would recommend in almost every instance using the Victor SPX over the Talon SRX because though the Talon SRX has a lot of features the Victor doesn't, such as current limiting, for the most part, um, they just won't affect your normal usage. So it's more important to kind of save where you can, um, mostly money and brushless motor controllers. The Neo 550s are really great because these are essentially a version of this Neo in the bottom right, except shrunken down significantly. So I highly recommend these if you need motors at the ends of arms or on intakes, anything where the weight becomes significant. And for those, I would recommend the Spark Max. However, for something like your drive base, the Falcon 500 is really excellent in terms of it's just kind of all around motor capabilities, it's torque, it's RPM, everything. So that would be your best choice. And with its integrated Talon FX for any intensive duties. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan asks, is there anything that you would recommend to learn about electronics in our free time? I think that outside of FRC, there is a lot to learn by just tinkering with microcontrollers. Um, you've, if you have an interest, you will find a wealth of information about the Arduino and Raspberry Pi. There are lots of other places to start, but those are great choices because they'll give you an introduction to electronics, a little bit of programming, and just expose you to a lot more than you'll see in FRC electronics. And then Rue asks, any advice on having an electronics testing board for either teaching or prototyping? An electronics testing board? So at least my vision of what that would be is mostly for your motors. 
So I would set up a board with one of each kind of standard motor controller or just a standard connection and have that as a way to easily check your motors that they're working. Um, otherwise, you don't exactly need a testing board. There is a tool in FRC and electronics in general called a multimeter. This is a very helpful tool because it has a thing called continuity testing along with a bunch of other functions. Continuity testing basically lets you check if an electrical connection is kind of secure, that there is continuity in the connection from point A to point B. So that's a great way to test if power is getting to your components successfully. Thank you. And then um, do you typically have problems with the Neo 550s wrapping up wires as its outmost shell is the one spinning? Ooh. I, I would have to look at it, but typically um, it's about how you kind of route the wires. And I can check really quick. I haven't worked with them in a while. The motors are slightly detached because they're on kind of a separate section from the base of the motor. If my memory serves me correct, I can check and get back to you though, if you would like. No worries, okay. Um, next one is, when would you use a brushed motor versus a brushless one? So brushless motors, they, for most applications have begun to win out they offer just greater torque, less wear and tear on the motor over time, and more power efficiency, um, along with being able to be a lot smaller, such as that Neo 550. Um, brush motors, though, because they're kind of more basic, are cheaper. So it's kind of that trade-off of the new modern thing versus the slightly more traditional but less expensive option. Um, thank you. And then the next one is best recommendations for electronic tools for an FRC shop. I would go with a multimeter, a crimping tool for Anderson power poles, um, wire cutters and wire strippers typically are found together. So wire strippers, these are used to take the insulation off of, off of a wire so that you can put a terminal or solder it. Such as in the top right, those sheaths of, over the wires, we can take those off so that we can throw Anderson power pulls on. Other than that, I would say a soldering iron, a little station. You typically find them together with like a solder tip cleaner and rolls of solder or spools of solder itself. And then, I would recommend buying in bulk just a larger spool of wire. Don't go for like a smaller 10 foot length rather than just uh, buy like a 50 or 100 foot even if you're a larger team and just cutting lengths off as needed. And that will cover most of your purposes for tools. Thank you. And then looks like I missed a question. Kylie asks, are there any specific safety practices that should be followed when doing electronics in FRC? So there are. Basically, you never want to be working, uh, whether it's soldering or crimping, anything like that on the robot if it's currently on. If you have ever worked in houses, you only want to touch the electronics when your breaker is off. Same thing with the robot. If the breaker is not off and the RSL is not off, you don't have your hands in the robot working on it. Um, more specific practices are the battery that you wanna be extremely careful with because any kind of short from the positive to negative terminal can be very dangerous with just a large amount of electricity or a fire starting. So with that, um, 
yeah, just be exceptionally cautious with that and make your wires soldered for the battery before you attach them. So solder and create them to the correct lengths separately. Then you attach one, attach the other, and you'll be fine. Other safety tips, when you solder, having some kind of ventilation is very important because hopefully you're using unleaded solder, but in general, the fumes are a bit hazardous. You don't wanna be breathing them in. And so just even like a small desk fan rather than like a fume hood is totally acceptable. You just want to have some kind of ventilation. Okay, and then we have two more questions. All right. The first one is, how often do te or should teams replace batteries and how should they be maintained? I don't have a specific kind of guideline for how often to replace batteries. Rather, you'll begin to notice as you use the battery frequently, its voltage will begin to decay over time. So rather than a nominal voltage of say, 14 volts, well, really 12, um, but it'll hit a voltage of around 14 volts. It might creep down over time to like 13, 12 and a half. And that's like your big indicator that it's beginning to be worn out. So just as these batteries get used more and more, their voltage and their capacity will both fall. Um, really, it's more up to you of what limits are acceptable because obviously a battery with less capacity and that can power your robot less isn't what you want but you definitely can use it on our team batteries when they're fresh are competition batteries as they begin to be worn out they're practice only and finally if they're really just not working we'll dispose of them Okay, perfect. And then our last question is, what kind of power pull connectors do you use? Um, and then do you use Andersons? Yeah, so we use Anderson power pulls. These you can find, or I typically buy them in bulk from powerworks.com. These, they have a few different types, 15, 30, and 45 amp rated connectors. 15 amp are the smallest, these are if you want to put a power pull on a small wire like a sensor. Um, let me go back to the diagram. So yeah, any of these smaller wires, if you would need to splice or jumper them, putting on a 15 amp connector would work. Slightly thicker wires can use 30 amp. And then your motors and uh, motor controllers, these will be 45 amp Anderson power pulls. What's nice about power poles is that even though you have three different sizes of these terminals, the outer housing, the plastic part, all works in between them. So you can connect a 15 amp power pole to a 30 amp power pole. You typically wouldn't, but it definitely won't like not work. And yeah, that should be it on Anderson's. Okay, thank you. And then before we go, do you have any last like words of advice, anything we didn't cover today? Um, so FRC Electronics is a phenomenal way to learn the skills. I highly recommend though, learning on your free time about what interests you because FRC Electronics is great, but there are a whole host of other things in electronics that you've never even seen wireless communications, um, how batteries kind of work at a basic level, all kinds of different topics. Just explore, see what interests you. And thank you, this was great. Okay. Thank you, Caden, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, that concludes the first day of the summer series. Tomorrow, Team Spatter will be presenting on drive bases at 5 p.m. And then at 5.50, we will be having a training a CAD team panel. Thank you all.